narcotics in Venezuela, why should you care? Just this Saturday, I was reading in, in the Salt Lake Tribune, and there were three articles that I thought were related to uh, narcotics in Venezuela. First of all, it talked about President Chavez and the demonstrations that are happening right now, organized by the opposition to oppose constitutional reform in Venezuela. President Chavez is basically pulled out his history books and taken a Soviet Socialist, public, Soviet Socialist Republic constitution from that era and is trying to uh, get that kind of constitution passed in Venezuela. It will make him have, or at least have the ability to be president for life. Um, the other article was about Guinea-Bissau. That is a country in West Africa. It's a, it's a country with a very small economy, and it's turning into a narco state, much as Venezuela was, or excuse me, much as Colombia was in the, 80, in the 80s under Samper. And then finally, uh, if I say the name Brit and Garrett, what is that? Does that ring any bells for anybody? Brit and Garrett Reed. Who are they? They are the two sons of our much beloved coach of the Philadelphia, the Philadelphia Eagles, right? Members of the church. They have just been uh, uh, sentenced to 24 months in prison for drug-related crimes. So nobody's immune. I mean, it's out there. Um, people can think that it doesn't really affect you, but organized crime... Uh, somebody driving under the influence of narcotics, whether it be alcohol or methamphetamines or cocaine or heroin, they can have a tremendous impact on your lives. So I'd like to, first of all, make sure that we're speaking the same language. I need somebody that can interpret. How about you, sir? Stand up. I'm going to say something that most people wouldn't understand, but I think that you're going to understand. So just translate this into English. Two RMs were sitting in the HBL. Uh, one says to the other, did you hear about Little Miss CTR? She quit her job at the MTC. And she, uh, she's going to marry a Gentile. Thank you very much. Well, give him a hand. The State Department we have, or in government we have, our same sort of speak, and so I'd like to get a couple terms out there because I know that I won't be able to talk about my line of work without using some acronyms. So the very first acronym I'd like to, uh, first we'll go with the government, U.S. government side. The U.S. government, of course, is the USG. And then we have INL. Does anybody know what INL is? INL is the International uh, Narcotics and Law Enforcement Bureau in the State Department. It handles not only all the money that goes to Plan Colombia, which is, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars, but also all of the money that's going for reconstruction to Afghanistan and Iraq. You've probably seen in the news how they, that's the very office that did not manage very, very well, uh, what's it called, Black, Black, Black Marsh or Blackwater or something? Blackwater. Yeah, that's the office that's responsible for managing those contracts, and uh, it really got too much for them to do, and now they've turned it over to the Department of Defense. But that's, that's an important bureau in the State Department, INL. The NSC is uh, the National Security Council. The ONDCP, does everybody know what that is? The ONDCP. That's the drug czar's office. We've all heard of the drug czar. And that stands for the Office of, Na the office of National Drug uh, Control Policy. There you go. DEA, DEA is the Drug Enforcement Agency. What, what makes, what's kind of, what is the DEA? Does anybody know? Yeah, but what is it? We all know what the FBI is, right? We've all seen X-Files. What about the DEA? Well, the DEA is basically the mirror reflection of the FBI, except they focus on drugs, and that's all they do. They focus on organized crime involved with drugs. They are part of the Department of Justice, just as is the FBI. 
They work for the Attorney General, just as does the FBI. And they have but the very, very narrow focus of, of narcotics, of drugs. Southcom. Does anybody know what Southcom is? Southern Command. It's, uh, I should have asked you, Bryce. Southcom are the, the army, the, our military divides up the world into military commands, and Southern Command is that area of the world that includes South, Amer South and Central America and the Caribbean. And the military, our military has a very prominent role in our drug control policy. Um, here, I'll, I'll give you a tough one, Bryce. JADF South. That is the Joint Intelligence, Joint, no, excuse me, Joint Interagency Task Force South. And it's part of Southcom, and it focuses on the Caribbean and uh, South America. And then one final acronym is the CCDB. That's the Cocaine Control Database. How do you know what cocaine or how much cocaine is being sent from Venezuela or from other countries to the United States or to Europe? Well, that's the, there's a whole office with dozens of, of people working there trying to gather this data, interpret it, and come up with figures. Now, on the other side, on, on the other side of the court, we have the, the BRV. That's the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela. So if I refer to the Venezuelans, I usually say the BRV. The ONA, the ONA, which is the Office of, this is Spanish acronyms I'm translating now, the Office of National, uh, the, uh, the National Anti-Drug Office, and that's their drug czar. That's my counterpart in Venezuela. The CICPC is the federal police. It's more or less the counterpart of the, of the FBI. The Guardia Nacional, this is getting, let's just leave some of these things out. A little bit too much in the weeds. At any rate, um, these are the major players in the, this constant battle that we have with uh, narcotics traffickers. Now, in the U.S. government, we look at three different kinds of areas. There are source zones, transit zones, and consumption zones. Now, can anybody give me an example of a, a consumption zone? Go ahead. The United States of America, Salt Lake City, Utah. Consumption zones, that's that, you know, they don't grow cocaine, they don't have cocaine labs, but that's where, that's the market, that's where, you know, the final objective is. And the drug traffickers want to get that cocaine to Salt Lake so they can sell it to people. Now, a transit zone, logically, would be the area where it's neither consumed nor produced, but it has to pass through that area to get from point A to point C. And the source zone, of course, is the area where it's actually grown or manufactured. So the source zone in this case is Colombia, Peru, and Bolivia. The transit zones would be the Caribbean, and in this case, Venezuela. Venezuela is a major transit area. Why do so many drugs go through Venezuela? Who can, who do you, does anybody want to take a guess as to what the number one reason is for this tremendous influx of drugs through, through Venezuela. A lot of drugs can go through the Pacific up through Mexico. Mexico is a transit area. It's actually a source zone. It's all three, Mexico. But the big reason that so many drugs are passing through Venezuela today is a result of U.S. government policy. A major policy effort in Colombia called Plan Colombia. Plan Colombia is invest tens or, no, excuse me, hundreds of millions of dollars in helping the Colombian government, which is engaged in a civil war against drug traffickers, okay? So in Colombia, you have, you have the, what are the major guerrilla groups there? FARC. The FARC and the ELN, right? All of their weapons, all of their operations are paid for through drug trafficking. That's where they get the money. The Soviet Union isn't around anymore to get these guys money. Cuba doesn't have the wherewithal to fund these groups. And so all of their money comes from drug trafficking. And so they are, you know, that's, and they're trying to take over the Colombian government. And they've, they've almost done it a couple of times. And so we, the U.S. government, it's not in our interest to have drug traffickers in control of Colombia. <coughs> and so we're trying to spend a lot of money buying, buying military equipment, sending down military advisors, and lots of money to help that government basically defend itself against 
the insurgents who are funded through drug trafficking. Okay, so what happens if Colombia can't, if the drug traffickers are, can't send the drugs directly from Bogota to Mexico now? Well, it has to go somewhere. There's pressure now on the drug traffickers in Colombia to find somewhere else to go. So first it's squirted out through Ecuador and the Pacific. They have fast, fast boats would leave Columbia fast boats. Go fast boats are, you know, those long cigarette boats from like Miami Vice. Anybody remember Miami? I don't know if they still have Miami Vice, but those really long boats. They'll put maybe, you know, 500 kilos in those boats and they just speed out there, you know, going 60, 70, 80 miles an hour. And then they'll meet up with container ships, larger ships, fishing vessels, transfer the cocaine. Well, okay. They started uh, with the Colombians a using AWACS and other, other sophisticated radar systems, they were able to clamp down on that. And so now the drug traffickers have to look for another area to go. Where, where are the drug traffickers, traffickers are gonna go? Where, well, excuse me, where would they go? And it's the answer that you said, right? That they're gonna go, like water, to the area of least resistance. And, and Venezuela right now offers the least resistance for drug traffickers. Why? Well, this border right here is very, very big approximately 1,400 miles, 2,200 kilometers. It's porous. You can walk across, there's no, you know, there's no border guard every 10 feet to make sure that people just don't walk across. I mean, they have villages built on the border. People walk, you know, so it could just be a ditch you step across to get from one country to the other. And so it's very easy for drugs to pass from Colombia to Venezuela, okay? Once they get to Venezuela, what's gonna, you know, what normally would stand in the way of drugs transiting, and that would be the law enforcement section, section of, of Venezuela, or of any country. But Venezuela right now is one of the most corrupt countries uh, in the world. In fact, Transparency International, have, that's, they, they create a list, kind of like US World News reports list of universities, right? And they rank all the, the countries from one to 179, 179 countries appear on this list. And guess where Venezuela falls? 162, right? That's right there with Haiti. That's right there with Chad, right? It is the most corrupt country, with the exception of Haiti, in the entire Western Hemisphere. You know, it's, it's completely, You know, it's a, it has serious problems that way. Another problem, plomo o plata. What would that mean if you're a drug trafficker? Go ahead. Cash or lead. Cash or lead, and that means? Bullet. A bullet. So if the drug trafficker comes up to you, your police officer working in Venezuela or Mexico or Colombia or wherever else, and you earn maybe in Venezuela, you might, if you're lucky, earn a million believers a month. That's roughly $200. So. You've got, you know, you wanna, you're, you're already living in your parents' basement in a shanty town outside of Caracas, and the person says to you, you're, as you're at the border crossing or whatever, you know, listen, I'll, you can take this money or I'll shoot you. But either way, you're gonna turn, you know, you're not gonna, you're gonna let these drugs go by. What kind of decision is that? It's an easy decision. And so it's, uh, it's very easy to buy influence, to buy law enforcement, policemen, military, and that goes all the way up the chain. And it always has gone all the way up the chain, all the way to judges, to fiscales. Fiscales, um, they, they have the Napoleonic justice system, so that, I guess that would be kind of a combination judge-prosecutor in our, in our system. And you can go all the way up the chain, and now, unfortunately, you have a government who doesn't like the United States. President Chavez hates President Bush. He would rather cut off his nose than have to say anything nice about the United States. Right? He absolutely, he's convinced that the United States organized a coup against him in 2002. I don't think that's true. I wasn't there in 2002, but I really don't think that we had anything to do with the, the coup that tempor temporarily removed him from power in 2002. And he thinks we are the great Satan of uh, the universe. And so he will not cooperate with the United States government. And, and, and unfortunately, the United States government, well, it's two factors, excuse me. 
barrel, how much is it? Uh, sorry, oil costs $100 a barrel. Venezuela is a major producer of oil. They don't need U.S. money. They don't need U.S. assistance. They don't need us at all. That's a very, very different situation from every other single country in, in South America. There's two other recently elected leftist governments. Who knows which ones they are? Ecuador, I heard somebody say, right? And Bolivia. Bolivia. Who was elected president of Bolivia? Everyone. And what's he? What, what was his job before he got was a president? He was a cocalero, right? He grew coca leaves, and his big platform is coca is sacred. It's our heritage. We should not be eradicating it. So, and then in Nicaragua, we, you know, you know who's back in power in Nicaragua? Daniel Ortega, right? The original Sandinista. And these guys are all financed by Hugo Chavez. All of the, you know, their election money, and you even saw election money going to the Cristina who just won in Argentina. $800,000 of cash was intercepted in Argentina to go to support her campaign. Anyway, so you have these um, these leaders, but and so far it's not so bad in Bolivia and Peru because even though they are getting lots of money under the table from Hugo, they still need U.S. resources to make their police work because they don't have you know a lot of money and they count on U.S. resources to help them that way. So fortunately, uh, in Bolivia and Ecuador, we still have pretty good counter narcotics cooperation. Um, We'll see what happens in Ecuador because that's what we have the base actually in Ecuador. Um, an FOL. Anybody want to, you know what that is? Forward operating location. And so they have equipment and planes staged there. They fly AWACS planes. Those are the big radar, you know, with the mushroom on top of the planes. Flying them in this area to try to monitor all of the private aircraft that are flooding into the Caribbean and into Mexico. Because they don't fly directly into the United States, but they fly into the Caribbean, and right now, mostly into the uh, Dominican Republic and Haiti, and into Mexico. They land on clandestine airstrips, they unload their product, and then they take off. So, that's the situation as far as um, uh, that goes. And that's, you know, that's kind of gives you a better understanding of why we have a problem and, and how it's... Uh, how it's developing. I'd like to also talk a little bit about U.S. cooperation because that's what I'm in charge of. I'm not a DEA agent. I'm not a policeman. I'm a Foreign Service officer. In fact, if you, for those of you who know anything about the Foreign Service, I'm a political officer. This is my first assignment where I've not been a political officer. I'm, I'm doing a cross-cone or interfunctional position where I'm in charge of, the, of programs. Now, normally, the Narcotics Affairs and Law Enforcement <coughs> section is it's kind of the the, the policy and financial office of our foreign policy abroad. And so while DEA works with the cops, teaches them how to do stuff, provides training, NAS, or the State Department in this case, is the one that provides the, tr the money for that, that kind of stuff to happen and oversees the programs to make sure that, number one, no human rights violators are participating in these programs, and that they, the contracts and everything else that are signed with these governments are fulfilled. How this works is that every year, Congress appropriates money. Uh, for this region, it's called ACI, the Andean Counter Drug Initiative. It's uh, you know hundreds of millions of dollars every year appropriated by Congress. Now, how the money, how, how it's supposed to work is that we, the State Department, signed governments, or signed with these uh, governments, letters of agreement, annually. And in those letters of agreement, we lay out what our counter-narcotics counter policy is going to be. And then, that money technically is there. We administer, we, administer it, we administer it, but when we buy, let's say, a truck, or a helicopter, or refurbish an office, that's theirs. It's not ours anymore. The money is theirs. We just administer it to make sure that it's not wasted, or, or at least less is wasted. And then, um, but in Venezuela, we haven't signed an agreement with them since 2004. And I'd like to go over a little bit the history of, of that because maybe just to give you a better understanding of um, how we got to this, this impasse of 
Because both both governments speak out against counter-narcotics, excuse me, both governments speak out against drug trafficking, but they're not working together. Well, in 2005, DEA and the Guardia Nacional had a big choke, a big um, conflict. And that's primarily be, primarily because the half the, 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 uh, the chief of the National Guard is a drug trafficker. He was a drug trafficker. His name was General Morgallo. You can look him up on probably Google him and find him. And he accused the DEA when the DEA started pinching operations that, that were coming out of his pocket. Let me back up a little bit. Now, in, the, in Columbia, you have, remember, two guerrilla groups? I forgot there's a third, the paramilitaries. Right? The paramilitaries are people who technically are support the government, they're against the insurgencies, but in fact, they're just conservative drug, tra drug, drug traffickers. Everybody's a drug trafficker. You have the liberal and the conservative, right? You have the FARC, which is the leftist drug traffickers, and then you have the paramilitaries, who are the conservative drug, drug traffickers. Anyway, the drugs moving through Venezuela. The Venezuelans have never had any problem grabbing paramilitary drugs, right? They'll grab the AUC drugs, but they won't touch the FARC drugs. And it's been like that for a long time. However, um, DEA working and you know, with NASA support was able to kind of squeeze some of the operations that were affecting the pocketbook of some of these generals in the Army, generals in charge of the entire counter-narcotics operation, and they began to squeal. And they, how they tried to uh, disrupt this is to accuse DEA of being spies, of trying to foment a coup, of uh, a number of other um, false accusations. And so President Chavez, whether you believe it or not, in um, basically July of 2005, declared that DEA would be expelled from Venezuela. Okay, well, we waited for us, you know, because you can't expel, in the world of diplomacy, you can't expel a diplomat unless you notify them formally. Right? You just can't say in the press, I expel you know, the Iranian representative at the, at the UN. Oh, you've got to, you know, you, there are procedures, protocols you have to follow. So we waited. They never came. We followed up, and, and, and then in the end, they backtracked. They didn't want to expel the DEA, but they said they needed a new agreement to try to muzzle the DEA to make sure that they didn't violate Venezuelan sovereignty. Well, that was in 2005. We didn't really want new, another agreement. We already had plenty of agreements, but they said, we said, all right, if it's so important to you, we'll, we'll do one. We worked out with our counterparts a mutually acceptable addendum to an existing counter-narcotics uh, agreement that we had. But then the Venezuelans kept postponing the signing. And this went on for months and months and months. And all of 2006 basically was postponed. In 2007, this year, all of a sudden it was, we don't need your stinking agreement. We don't want to have anything to do with you. In fact, we don't, you guys, it'd be sinful for us to deal with you because DEA is the world's biggest drug cartel. And this is the Minister of um, Interior and Justice in Venezuela who starts saying these things, right? Accusing DEA of being the biggest, world's largest drug cartel. So that's all of 2007. What do you do bureaucratically? You have an office there to keep me in Venezuela and all the people that work for me it costs the US government taxpayers a million dollars a year. And that's not program money, that's just overhead. Um, does it make sense to keep an office there? in Venezuela that costs a million dollars a year that's not doing its main mission? This young lady's shaking her head. This young lady's shaking her head. I don't know. The, it's kind of uh, the counter, you know, that's the logical. I mean, I agree, logically it doesn't make any sense. But on the other hand, does it make sense to have a major transit area with no U.S. representation there to focus on counter narcotics? If you know hundreds of millions of dollars of, of drugs and, and money laundering proceeds are, are passing through this area, does it make sense just to give up, close, put up your, you know, we're closed for business and leave? And so the State Department has been wrestling with this for a while. And what complicates this whole thing is that is our bureaucracy. We plan budgets three years out. And so if we're going to shut down an office tomorrow, we decide tomorrow we're going to shut this office, that office has money for three more years. Okay? And so what happens usually is you have, you know, you all heard the term bureaucratic inertia. <clears throat> well, 
you decide, well, we don't know what to do, so we won't do anything. And so we won't fund new money for this office, but you really can't take money away because, don't ask me why, but in government it's, it's impossible once money's been congressionally notified. Um, in other words, there's a process where you have to tell Congress where you're sending this money, and once you've told them where you're going to send it, changing that bureaucratically becomes uh, very difficult. So now we're, the State Department's wrestling, you know, FY08, which began October 1st, there's no money budgeted for my office. But they never made a decision to shut it down. So it's, a, it's, it's a kind of a quantity that way. Um, and then one more aside before I get back to this, uh, this other question we're looking at. So what do I do if, I, if I'm not, if I can't work with the Venezuelans, if I can't work with the police, if I can't, because you know, the, the government tells, if you work with the gringos, we'll fire you. If you work with the gringos, we'll send you, you know, out in the jungle or we'll suspend you. And that's happened to a lot of my contacts. You know, just for having a meeting, the person loses their job, even though they're from the, you know, the president of a, of a major court. In, in fact, in Maracaibo, if you want to look it up, was suspended just for organizing a meeting with, uh, with me. So um, we can't do that with we do. Well, what we're doing with this money that's been set aside for counter-narcotics is public diplomacy. We're reaching out to the Chavista areas, going into those neighborhoods, and we're building schools. We're um, implementing demand reduction programs. Demand reduction normally, that's like trying to convince kids not to do drugs. Just say no. That would be an example of a demand reduction program. <clears throat> normally, that would be a very small part of our budget. But, but because the government won't work with us, more and more of our money is going into those kind of programs. It's a good, it's a good thing. But it's good for Venezuela. It doesn't really keep cocaine off the streets of a pro. So it's, a, it's kind of a quandary that way. And now we've got to decide what we're going to do. And to complicate matters, we have a new ambassador. Patrick Deddy just replaced William Brownfield as an ambassador. And sometimes governments look at the replacements of ambassadors as, as an opportunity to shake things up. Well, Venezuela has been the target of a lot of criticism recently for its you know, the flood of cocaine. You know, the, the Caribbean has been really, really critical, uh, especially the Dominican Republic. Last in Venezuela for these, you know, there's flights have, have gone up from, in the, in the early 2002, there were like 25 flights, because they can see these things, right? They just can't get there in time to intercept them. So they know if the flight takes off from an illicit airfield and it lands someplace, they could say, well, that's pretty much, we, we, we suspect that's a drug flight. They don't know for sure, but it's a good chance that it was a drug flight. Well, maybe there was 25 in 2002. Well, this this year, right? There there are hundreds, right? It's been an increase, you know, of more than 500 percent of those kind of flights that are leaving from illicit airfields, like just you know strips in the jungle, no flight plans, no communication with uh, the the towers, and. So we know, you know, they, these com these countries are really, really concerned because drug trafficking itself corrupts everything it touches, because so much money is involved, right? It, it, just like you know the Plumore Plot argument, everywhere it goes it corrupts um, society, warps well, labor patterns. So it's a huge problem for the Dominican Republic now, even though the drugs really aren't staying there; <clears throat> they're on their way to the United States, but. <coughs> That's kind of a misnomer because often drug traffickers pay in drug, in kind, right? They'll say, okay, well, we don't have a lot of cash, we're going to give you a couple kilos. You know? And what do they do with that? They sell it. Let's see, I lost my train of thought. Oh, the ambassador. So we have the new ambassador. Ambassador Daddy met with President Chavez. He's been there three months. We finally got a chance. You have to present your credentials. When you're a new ambassador, one of the important things you do is you present your credentials personally to the president. Normally, it's in a group. He did it with five other people. But President Chavez took him aside and said, you know, we've really got to get things back on track. The relations between our two countries have become a little bit too chilled. Um, I suggest we get back to, you know, we, we find some area where we can cooperate and we, you know, we start we start doing that. And the ambassador suggested, well, why not counter narcotics? Why not counter uh, narcotics? And President Chavez says, that sounds like a good idea. Let's concentrate. Let's try to cooperate some more counter narcotics. Well, that just happened a week ago. 
a person, the, the drug czar, the Venezuelan drug czar, was replaced in March 2005. Before that, we had a great relationship with her. But his replacement, there's been two subsequent, they wouldn't even, the newest one wouldn't even uh, see me, wouldn't even take my telephone calls, wouldn't even uh, accept a courtesy visit. Well, all of a sudden, since I actually left um, Caracas to come on this trip, he called my office and said, hey, well, we, got, we should get together and talk about things. That's the first time that's happened. So it could be an indication that maybe some bilateral cooperation is in the works, but I suspect it won't amount to anything. Just to give an example of, of how things like that work in Venezuela, two examples, in fact. <clears throat> One of the big projects we had before the, the government shut us down was a container inspection facility. We suspect that a lot of drugs enter in, in, into Venezuela at the Cucuta border crossing, which is down here more or less. Excuse me, it's right by here. Oh, here it is, sorry, Cucuta. So it's right here, and it crosses up to the Puerto Cabello, which is right here. So there's a road that goes like this. And we, we suspect that's a major cocaine corridor, multi-ton shipments, right? And we decided with, you know, the, Vels, the Venezuelans, in fact, asked us to build a container inspection facility, a place where they could take large containers, right? You know what I'm talking about? The kind that go on um, ships or on the back of trucks. Well, in a, in a, in a wet, stinky port, how do you have access to see what's inside of that without ruining, ruining everything that's inside of it? And so what we did is build this really nice warehouse we bought a really expensive x-ray machine, and we're just about finishing the touches on it when this whole thing fell apart. You know, it's a three, three and a half million dollar investment. Well, what are we gonna do with it? And uh, one of the, we've been trying to get some of you to take it off our hands, because it's been mothballed. We've been paying guards to guard it, so people don't come in and steal all the forklifts and computers and everything else we have in there. <clears throat> but Everybody in the government is afraid to sign a document with the United States government because if they do, they know their careers are over. You sign an agreement with the gringos, you are an evil imperial, imperialist, you're not part of the revolution, you're banished. Well, the, in, this is really complicated, but there's also state politics. And the port itself is controlled by the state of Carabobo. That's a funny name I know. It means, what does Carabobo mean? What was the word again? Car what? Carabobo. I don't mean to face something, but I don't know. Somebody said something. Clown face. Yeah. So that's the name of the state. State of the clown face state. <laughs> so um, the, we, we've been trying to work with the Port Authority, which is under the, the governor of Carabobo. And we've asked for appointments. They said, we went down there one time and said, so, okay, we're going to meet with the president of the port. And so I drove down there, it's a five hour drive each way, okay? So 10 hours. If, if we never did it, usually we, I, I forbid people from going one day, usually you spend the night in Valencia, but uh, it's five hours each way. And we went down there one time, we met with the deputy port director. He said, yeah, we'd like to take this container inspection facility off your hands. And I said, well, listen, we'd be happy to give it to you, sign it over to you, but number one, you're gonna have to sign a document with us. That says, number one, you're accepting responsibility. Number two, you're going to use it for some law enforcement related purpose. It can't just be, you know, your social club. It can't be, um, it has to be something related to con uh, looking at contraband or, or something related to drugs. They said, okay, we'll look at it. So I get a call three weeks later and they said, okay, can you come down and meet the president? Can you come down again? We want to talk about this some more. But listen, we've talked about it enough. Now it's in the balls in your court. You need to come up with a plan to tell us how you think you're going to use it. And the guy says to me, yeah, but our president really wants to meet you. The, the president of the port. He's like the director of ports and one layer bit above him was the, the, uh, the president of the port authority. And so he really put the pressure on me. We don't have a very good relationship. Normally I would have just blown him off because I, would, I was going to have to go and come back at the same day because I had another trip planned. And so I said, fine. Uh, you know, I'll clear my schedule. I'm coming. I can come on Wednesday. Is that? He said, "Come down. We'll feed you lunch, and uh, and you can meet with the president. We can decide what we're going to do." So I did that. We got. We had to get up at Odar Hundred, 
drive down, and we get down there, and the guy invites us, you know, the, we'll just call him Pepe, invites me to his office, and we're waiting around, and go, well, what about the, the colonel? Because the colonel was actually the, the, the president, the big cheese that we're supposed to meet with. And he goes, oh, yeah, he'll be along. But he never showed up. He never came. And we never had the meeting. And it was, I was a little bit frustrated because I had to drive back that same day. And he was, and I'm just not spending 10 hours in the car in one single day is just, is more than I like to do. So I get back there the week that, I'm, last week he called again and said, well, the president wants to meet with you again. And he never said, I'm sorry, the president never said, he never even acknowledged that they had inconvenienced us at all. He just kind of went along like, oh, well, yeah, the president's a little <coughs> busy, you know, and he was not going to make it, but, you know, the, the whole reason I went down there was to meet with the president. <coughs> So we'll see what happens with that. I um, I don't see a lot of possibilities with the um, the Port Authority. Another kind of crazy example of dealing with it as well and with the BRV. Um, one of the, the people that we used to have really good contacts with was Customs. Customs we call Senyat. I don't know what it stands for. Secretary, some secretary of something. But anyway, it's it's, I don't want it. it's, it's Customs. And the acronym is S-E-N-I-A-T. And the leader of Senyat is a very important Venezuelan political figure. His name is Biel Mamor. So if any of you guys do Venezuela, you recognize that name. We used to have a great relationship. In fact, it was his idea to build the, the container inspection facility. Well, when things went uh, south in March of 2005, he stopped answering my phone calls, and he stopped answering the ambassador's phone calls. But all of a sudden, about a year ago, we called up and he wanted to see the ambassador, and the ambassador was going to bring me. And uh, of course, the real issue he wanted to see us about was who can guess? Kelsey. What would he really want to see us about? Visas, right? He needed a visa to go do something, or his sister's brother, or somebody needed a visa. And so he drug me and the ambassador into his office, and he treated us like nothing was different. Like, you know, it was just like it was two years ago when things were great. You know, he, you know, we kind of asked, no, well, we have, don't have any contact. Oh, that's silly. Of course we want to work with you. I go, well, you know, can you give us a point of contact in customs? Because everybody there that I know has told me that they have instructions not to talk to us. Oh, sure, he gave us a name. And his whole demeanor was that things are great. Things are wonderful. Of course we want to cooperate. You know, we're technicians. You know, we can cooperate on technical stuff. Well, after the meet meeting was over and he got his visa, I called the guy one time. He goes, hey, I don't know anything about this. <clears throat> if you, you know, because this is the guy we used to cooperate with. Let me check and see. And he calls back um, a couple days later and says, listen, I cannot meet with you. I have very clear instructions from the top that I cannot meet with you. And so the whole song and dance from the, the, the leader of his institution to us officially was, was I don't know what it was. It was surreal. But um, that's, that's the kind of um, everyday working experience that we have in Venezuela. And Caracas is a lovely city. It's great weather. It's beautiful. I've extended everywhere that I've ever gone to as a foreign service, service officer, but I will not extend in Caracas. It's just too frustrating. And it's too depressing to see. And now I'm, I'm speaking more personally than I am with my official foreign service hat on, but just to see how the future of Venezuela is being flushed out the toilet. And that's all I have to say. Thank you very much.